Welcome back to Frozen Bites, the Frozen Arc podcast. I'm Rianne and I'll be your host for today. Previously, we have discussed the origins of the Frozen Arc, the Virtual Arc project and climate change. If you've missed any of these episodes, you can find them on our YouTube channel. Today, we're going to be talking about CryoArcs. This is a UK-based partner of the Frozen Arc. This project provides cryopreservation infrastructure and databasing facilities in order to gather and manage genetic material for conservation and research. This project collects material from all animal species in UK collections, not just endangered species. It aims to bring together samples which have been collected previously with new sample collections, both physically and informatically, to provide a fully comprehensive and accessible resource for scientific use. The mission of this project is to create a national zoological biobank, which enhances and links the many diverse and disconnected frozen collections of animal genetic material found in universities, zoos, aquariums, museums and research institutes across the UK. It then facilitates the responsible and sustainable use of these collections for a range of applications that will enhance fundamental research and species conservation. CryoArcs is an umbrella project which hopes to connect frozen collections from across the UK, making them more accessible to the scientific community. This work differs from the Frozen Arc project, which works with partners both in the UK and worldwide and collects samples from endangered and threatened species only. Today, we have the incredible opportunity to interview Kirsty Lloyd and Mike Bruford, who are both part of the CryoArcs team, in order to learn some more about this amazing project. Firstly, we will be speaking to Kirsty Lloyd, who is a technician based at the Natural History Museum in London. Kirsty will be explaining to us today how CryoArcs operates and functions on a day-to-day basis. Kirsty supports the enhancement of collections at the NHM, as well as consolidating existing collections at other institutions. Thank you so much for joining us today, Kirsty, and taking the time to answer our questions. Just starting with the first question, um, could you start by explaining to us what a biobank is? Um, So a biobank is a repository that stores samples for research purposes. Uh, Many people will be familiar familiar with the biobanks for human tissue or seed banks, for example. Um, But I work in a zoological biobank which stores samples from animals. Um, The samples I deal with include tiny organisms like insects in tubes um, to dissected tissues um, like muscle um, or even blood and cell cultures. Um, A repository could be a single facility, a dedicated facility, or a a network of institutions all working together to store samples uh, and make them available for research. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's really interesting. And so that we can sort of think about what, what these biobanks might look like, could you explain what sorts of things you might find when you're in a biobank? Um, yeah, so if you um, if you were, walked, were to walk through the molecular collection facility at the Natural History Museum in London, where I work, um, it has the capacity to store um, samples at all sorts of different temperatures. So we have ambient storage units, uh, which look like cabinets that store dried samples like plant material at room temperature, pre- temperature but they're humidity controlled. Um, so they regulate the moisture, the level of moisture that the um, sample is exposed to. Uh, we have um, tall freezers, like domestic freezers, like you find in your kitchen, um, that um, hold samples at minus 20 degrees C. Um, we, we also have larger, upright, ultra-low temperature freezers, which are much bigger than the domestic freezers, um, as well as chest freezers. And these hold samples at minus 80 degrees Celsius, which is pretty chilly. Um, if a facility has a lot of freezers, like at the molecular collection facility, the room will also be um, uh, air conditioned as well, and it helps keep the, the room cool, which helps ensure that the freezers are working properly. So the combination of the air conditioning units in the room as well as the freezers running means that you always hear a low hum in the room, in the background. Mm. 
molecular collection facility also has um, three purpose-built um, tanks in the liquid nitrogen room. Um, so these are about the size, imagine a KA car. They're just slightly smaller than that. Um, they store samples in liquid nitrogen vapor. So liquid nitrogen fills, fills the bottom of the tank and the rest of the tank is filled with vapor. Um, and that creates a very, very, very cold uh, little environment, keeping the samples at around minus 170 degrees Celsius. Um, so all of the different storage methods um, that I've mentioned are monitored uh, to make sure that they are maintaining a steady temperature. So if a, a, if a remote monitoring system is in place, like at the molecular collection facility, then an alarm will sound if a freezer is getting too warm and someone will usually get an alert uh, so they can move the samples to a backup freezer if needed. Um, and usually that alert comes in the middle of the night or a weekend because none of these things happen during the week. <laughs> Um, also, a, a biobanking facility may have a lot, all sorts of other equipment that are uh, dotted about. So you might have insulated transportation boxes, uh, which look like big stock polystyrene boxes with cardboard outer sleeves used to transport samples on ice, dry ice. Or you'll have portable freezers that plug into your car. Um, or you have dry shippers. Uh, so a dry shipper is like a large, um, heavy canister containing a, a cylinder. And inside that cylinder, you pour liquid nitrogen and then you leave it overnight. And the whole temperature within this, inside the cylinder cools right down. And then you can pour off that liquid nitrogen the, day, the, the next day. And the insulating material inside the canister will keep a sample at about minus 150 degrees C for about a week, which means you can transport everything cold as cold as possible, keeping your temperature as consistent as possible without the need for liquid nitrogen topics, which makes it a safe way um, to cold chain samples um, between institutions. So it's quite yeah. an interesting space with lots yeah, of interesting kids. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I realised like how many different methods there were. I think in my head it was just you sort of got like minus 20 and then maybe minus 80 and minus like 100 or 190 or something. But but obviously you've got so many different like things that you're trying to store. You need to have the humidity and the, the different sort of air conditions as well as the temperatures. So that's really interesting. And so obviously, how does the sort of whole method of keeping them cold help to keep these, these specimens preserved? Yeah, so um, keeping things cold is actually really, really important. Um, so a tissue sample like muscle, for example, is made up of cells. And inside the nucleus of that cell uh, is your genome. Uh, imagine the genome is a ball of string all rolled up. Um, the string is the DNA sequence that holds the blueprint for how that plant or animal is put together. Um, if you break up the cell and unravel that ball of string and unravel that genome, sequencing machines can read the sequence. But um, when DNA degrades, it breaks down. That long string gets cut up into lots of small pieces. Um, so uh, DNA degradation happens when the piece of tissue decays. Keeping the samples cold helps to slow down that degradation. It slows down the decay and it slows down the breakdown of your DNA sequence. So the colder the samples um, are held, the slower the degradation and the more intact your string, your genome will be. Um, this is not to say that uh, degraded samples have no value. They're still valuable. It just depends on, on your research question. So if you're looking at the whole genome, um, you may only read a small section of that genome um, if it is fragmented and that can tell you certain things. Um, you wouldn't necessarily store samples that have been degraded in liquid nitrogen either, because that's quite an expensive way of storing samples. And it's the coldest way. You want things that are really nicely intact. And that's when you store them in, in, in your, your coldest method. So you might choose to store a slightly degraded sample in minus 80 or minus 20. And that's why a biobank has lots of different storage conditions. It depends on the samples you have and um, what they might need um, in respect to how they're stored. Yeah, that's really interesting. Obviously, you've got to think about what you've got and what you're trying to do with it before you actually sort of go in with a different method. Yeah, it's, it's about understanding, well, assessing the value of your sample and that, that can depend on how, how intact it is or how degraded it is, or it, it can depend on what it's come from. What sort of information is stored in these tissues that, that we keep in the biobanks? Um, so, for example, if a, if a tissue sample has been um, collected from a, a, 
an animal or a plant and has been snack frozen, um, as for example, put straight into one of those dry shippers I was talking to you about earlier at minus 150 and kept at that temperature, then the genome will be as intact as you can get it, pretty intact. Um, and sequencing machines will be able to read the whole sequence from that organism and generate a lot of data. And a lot of data gives you a lot of information. Um, comparing the sequences from different parts of the genome can tell you different things. So you can in investigate the evolutionary relationships between one species and another, um, how a population has grown or declined over time, uh, whether an individual is related to another individual, um, and assess genetic diversity to understand whether a population or species may be resilient to environmental change, for example. Um, so biobanks and all of the samples they hold and all of the information they, they contain um, are treasure troves of data that enable us to learn more about our planet, uh, while I think empowering us to safeguard its biodiversity, um, both now and in the future. Yeah, that's really, um, obviously really important. Um... What sorts of animals do we have represented in biobanks at the moment? So it depends on the focus of the biobank. Um, so the molecular collections facility at the Natural History Museum um, strives to represent global biodiversity and contains material from a wide range of different taxonomic groups from around the world, uh, including uh, lizards, frogs, snakes, bees, mammals, spiders, fish, and, and all sorts of other things. Um, this means that um, the samples stored here and at other Cryox uh, partner hubs, such as National Museum of Scotland, uh, samples can be used for a range of conservation and um, empirical research purposes. Um, some biobanks, uh, are all biobank initiatives, have a taxonomic or endangered species focus, um, such as the frozen arc. Um, other biobanks, uh, such as the European Association of Zoos and Aquaria, or EASA, uh, bring together uh, collections from the European Zoo and Aquaria community, uh, so including the, the, the British um, version, the BIASA, and their and the focus on supporting conservation um, population management, both in captivity and in the wild. So it really depends on what the biobank, what the purpose of the facility or the, um, the, the coordinated um, infrastructure is for. Um, but all are important repositories for genetic information and all are valuable resources for research and conservation. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like between all of the different sort of partners and biobanks there's a lot <laughs> there's a lot that's been stored already and hopefully more for for yeah, future the, research the capacity is well. definitely out there and the investment is definitely gradually being made more and more some um some are getting more investment than others over time um but i think the acknowledgement is there that the that we need to have the facilities the spaces and the initiatives to um coordinate and store these samples for future research because they are so valuable and they're such a valuable um not only a resource for understanding but a, a resource to to maintain for for future for conservation and for um maintaining the, the valuable biodiversity on our planet well great thank you that was um really informative and um i think i've even learned quite a lot about biobanks today great information so thank you Next, we will be speaking to Mike Bruford, who will be discussing the importance of the project and what it can achieve. Mike is the lead investigator of Cryoarks. His expertise is in genetic management of endangered species and the interaction between the genetic resources from wild species, zoo or other captive species and domestic species. He is also currently co-chair of the IUCN Species Survival Commission's Conservation Genetic Specialist Group. Thank you so much for answering our questions today. Just to start with, could you just explain in general what CryoArcs is, please? Yes, yeah, so CryoArcs is a, a project funded by the Biotechnology and Biological Sciences Research Council. It is a project funded essentially to create a UK national zoological biobank to support research and conservation. Um, and it includes a number of other biobanks, one of which is the Frozen Ark, but it also includes something called the IASA Biobank, which is the 
European Association for Zoos and Aquaria. They are a collaborator within it. Um, and it also includes um, material from museums and university laboratories. So essentially what it is, is a coalition of biobanks that's been put together to create a kind of a super biobank, if you like, which um, is all drawn together using a single common data portal and database. What are the sort of main um, aims that the project is trying to achieve with them? Yeah, well, what we identified was that there was a lack of connectedness between all of these different biobanks. Um, and that what we really wanted to do was create a, a common platform uh, for this material to be made available to researchers and conservationists. Um, and, and so, you know, people would be sending off lots of different emails to lots of different people and biobanks asking, um, you know, many questions. And there was a lot of duplication of effort. And also we didn't know what each other's biobanks necessarily contained. So um, the idea really is to produce a sort of a one-stop shop for requests and donations of samples. We also realized that in the freezers of many university laboratories, many research institutes and uh, museums, that there were lots of samples that were in there that have been there for many years. Maybe they were collected by somebody who has now moved on or retired or, or you know, um, has stopped working on that particular species. And so there's this vast untapped collection of material there that, um, that could be potentially made available. And, and one of the good reasons for making that stuff available is that you don't then need to go out back out into the field and collect material again, necessarily. Um, some of those uh, sampling sites may no longer exist. Um, you know, all, all sorts of reasons why sort of building on the legacy of what is sort of 40 years of population genetics research uh, would be a, a good a good thing to do. Um, so as not not to waste material, and also to um, rescue as much material that otherwise may just be thrown in the bin. Could you sort of explain how Cryworks is working towards some of these goals, um, and if there's any sort of particular success stories where they've been achieved or things like that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, during the three years that we've been running, um, we've been doing a whole bunch of different things, obviously getting all of the, the basic infrastructure together for the database, the web portal, but also we've been collecting samples where we can. COVID has affected us just like it's affected everybody, but we've been able to collect a lot of samples and we're receiving a lot of um, sample requests already. So it's it's working. Perhaps one of the most significant things that we've been able to do is uh, rescue a very, very nationally unique uh, collection of um, fibroblast cell lines from a whole variety of different animal species that was collected during the career of a famous Cambridge professor called Malcolm Ferguson Smith. Malcolm, Malcolm just retired and um, didn't have anywhere to store his material. So he would like, he wanted to actually donate it to the nation, if you like. So we were able to go and take his collection and bring it to the Natural History Museum, which is where we have our liquid nitrogen freezers. So now those, um, those fibroblast cell lines, which include lots of critically endangered species, a whole variety of different things, and they're very difficult to produce. Uh, they're now available and um, that's a huge um, boost and who knows if if cryox hadn't been in place whether or not that, that that material would then be have become available to everybody so uh, but there are a number of stories like that um, you know where we've been able to go in and um, collect um, whole collections when people have either moved on or um, sadly passed away or, or, or you know, the, a variety of different things of that nature. 
So we're, we've been able to now sort of consolidate the collection. Um, and we operate, basically, we're a consortium of um, ourselves at Cardiff University, but also Nottingham University, um, the Natural History Museum in London, which is where we have a, a large uh, freezer um, facility called the uh, Molecular Collections Facility, and National Museums of Scotland, and then also the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland and Edinburgh University. Our aim is not just to uh, conserve uh, wild species, but also domesticated species. So our colleagues at Edinburgh, who are based at the Roslyn Institute, which is predominantly an agricultural institute, are also um, participating from the perspective of biobanking domestic um, uh, genetic material, particularly from things like rare breeds of livestock and that, that kind of thing. So we're trying to bring all of these things together work together and, and uh, you know, bring together a consolidated collection that involves, you know, many, many samples from zoos, from agriculture, from universities, and, and you know, put it all under one umbrella, really. Yeah, that's really great. Um, it's obviously fantastic to have things that, are like, you can just sort of measure the success by, and it's clearly there's loads of things. I, I think one of the really gratifying things that's, that has happened over the last, um, I don't know, three or four months really since labs have opened up is that we've started to get a lot of requests for material. So people are finding us um, and they're making requests. Some of them we can honor because we have the material. Sometimes we can't because we don't have it yet or we may never get it, who knows. But at least people are using it um, and people are, you know, we, we've got a really great response from the community of people who want to donate donate as well as um, actually receive samples as well. So the community is building, and certainly over the next six months, I expect it to really um, increase in both directions. So how do you hope that these sorts of activities will be able to, to help conservation and research um, as time goes on? Yeah, well, I mean, one of the things that I think is quite important is, well, for conservation perspectives, um, one of the things that's important to know is that um, oftentimes, you know, the EASA biobank, which is the European Association for Zoos and Aquaria, that biobank is predominantly there for what they call the purposes of population management. So this is where you have a captive breeding program and you want to manage the genetic diversity within that captive breeding program um, so that you maintain as much genetic diversity as possible in the animals of a particular species. But what often is lacking in that kind of analysis is an understanding of what really should be there from the perspective of what genetic diversity is available in the wild. And it's combining the wild and the captive to get an idea of what proportion of the wild diversity the captive population represents, and also uh, what part of the range, the geographic range, the genetic diversity actually comes from in, in the um, captive breeding program. Um, and there are lots of examples where actually, you know, the, um, the captive breeding program shows a very unique profile, either because it was sampled in a very small part of the range, or because, um, it's lost genetic diversity in a very peculiar way, because when animals come into captivity, um, they, you know, the, the breeding success of individuals is determined by something completely different, which is how well they respond and survive in captivity. It's got nothing to do with their fitness in the wild. So we know that when um, populations are brought into captivity, either because of something called founder effect, where you're bringing in just a few individuals, or because of um, genetic drift, which is unequal family size, where some families breed more effectively than others because they're better adapted to captivity. You get a very unique profile developing in the captive population. So it's, you can't really just use the captive population to manage the genetic diversity or to understand the genetic diversity of a species many, in many cases. And it's bringing together the, the material that, that we'll have in labs, from research programs with um, the material and captive breeding programs that will better able us to contextualize the genetic diversity that we've got in captivity and manage it better into the future. 
Yeah, of course. I mean, having all these different sort of methods of conserving things are fantastic, but you need them all together for actually anything to to happen. Yeah, and and you know, there's some really peculiar examples you know, um, that that where where um, things like very early patterns of hybridization have have had an influence as well. So uh, a lot of captive populations. Um, either inadvertently or deliberately very early on in their, in their um, management, almost no stud books were kept 50, 60, 70 years ago and earlier. So we don't really know what happened at the beginning of many of these captive breeding programs. And sometimes they hybridize between subspecies. Sometimes they may have, um, you know, I mean, they're, they're, we know that there are hybrids between Indian and um African lions, for example, in captive breeding programs, um, the Indian um, population is genetically quite distinct, but on its own, it's very inbred. Um, there are some severe inbreeding depression in um, in in captive breeding programs of Indian tigers. So, so uh, Indian lions, sorry. So, so you know, there are, we we know oftentimes rather little about the origins of the captive breeding program uh, animals. Um, and so being able to cross refer makes a big difference. Just finally, I feel like you've covered this quite a lot already, but um, could you sort of outline why the project itself is is so important? Well, there are all sorts of reasons, I think. One of, one of them is if we get it right, then... We will take the pressure off sampling um, the remaining wild populations that are out there. We may encourage people not necessarily to go out uh, into the field and disturb natural populations because then there'll be sufficient material in, um, in, in the cryox collection. Um, we will um, enable, you know, material to be made available to UK researchers without the need necessarily to import that material um, and uh, have to undergo scrutiny of the Nagoya protocol, which on access and benefit sharing, which is a, a, a global agreement regarding transfer of genetic material across national boundaries. Um, so we will make sure that the genetic material within a country stays in a country. Um, and so that will help us all to access material that will be legal and that will be, um, you know, responsibly managed. But I think it's this final thing, which is this, this responsible management that, that will be really important, that we won't ever get into the situation again where we've got samples rotting in freezers. Uh, you know, where, where when, when a freezer goes down, you lose a whole batch. We'll have backups. We will have all of that material available. Um, and that will mean that um, that we've got a, a resource that people can use well into the future. And that could be from anything for taxonomic studies. It could be for population management studies, basic science, everything. Um, and so I think that that will um, make a huge difference, hopefully, uh, to the scientific community. Uh, it will enable it will enable projects to happen that otherwise would never be feasible and and so i think that that is a, in and of itself um hopefully will provide us with a uh, a strong reason to to do it into the future um and with with all of the trends that are ongoing at the moment in terms of it becoming more and more difficult to move genetic material around the planet um, because of these global agreements, I think it will help British researchers do this kind of research and, and researchers from overseas. We're also helping those as well. It'll enable people to do research in ways that they probably otherwise would not be able to do. Yeah, it sounds like the future prospects are just could be potentially fantastic and will hopefully just become more open as time goes on. So, yeah, I think that's everything I was going to ask. Thank you so much. So that's all for today's episode. 
thank you to everyone who listened. We really hope you enjoyed it and have learned something new about biobanking and the importance of the Cryoarks project. Thank you so much to Kirsty Lloyd and Mike Bruford for joining us today and explaining the project to us. Please subscribe to our account to make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming episodes.